Rollin McCready has been uh, at previous SSE meetings. Um, uh, Michael At Atkinson is uh, his main on-site technical assistance at the Heart Math Institute. Uh, <clears throat> the, the Arabic physician whose name I will not attempt to pronounce uh, was their co-worker on data gathering for this study and I was brought into it as uh, a uh, hired consultant to do some analyses for them and I end up being the presenter because I'm the one who's an SSE member. So um, one of the things that the Heart Math Institute, among others, has, has demonstrated is that uh, the heart is actually the most powerful source of electromagnetic signals in the body. Um, and uh, additional findings from previous Heart Math Institute research are that the, uh, the electromagnetic fields, at least it's generally presumed that it's the electromagnetic fields produced by the heart, have measurable effects on other organisms and people uh, near a given person. Uh, now, this, this raises the question of, of what about other electromagnetic magnetic fields? The uh, sort of Art Deco image here is uh, showing some of the frequencies or rather wavelengths involved in the Schumann resonances, which are the natural resonances of the Earth as a whole for electromagnetic radiation propagating between the surface and the ionosphere. Uh, those are by no means the only electromagnetic effects associated with the Earth's environment, and some of them have been shown to have effects on human physiology and psychology in studies that I'm not going to cite here because there's a lot of them. Um, <clears throat> so since the heart both generates and responds to electromagnetic signals, it seems natural to look at heart function as an indicator of the body's reaction to external fields. And the aspect that the heart math people thought was uh, best suited for this kind of analysis was heart rate variability, which Julie mentioned in her talk. Um, so the experimental program here, uh, HRV data was collected from 16 volunteers in Saudi Arabia over a six month period. The participants wore monitors for extended periods, not all the time, usually not 24 seven, but for extended slices out of this six month period. 10 different HRV measures were calculated from the raw heartbeat data on an hourly basis. And during this same period, 12 measurements of geomagnetic or cosmic variables were recorded on an hourly basis. So the 10 HRV measures, uh, don't worry, there will not be a, a, a quiz on this. Uh, the, the, this. This is just so that you can get a, a glance at, at the names of what they are. And we had 12 environment variables, uh, including several, ge several standard published geomagnetic uh, indices. PCN stands for the Polar Cap North Index, a measure of, of magnetic flux literally on the North Polar Cap. Um, the Schumann resonance appears again, and uh, there were four sets of GCI magnetometer readings. Uh, then there are cosmological uh, parameters not directly connected to geomagnetism. There's the solar wind speed, the sunspot number, the F10.7 index is a measure of how much radio emission the sun is putting out at a, frequent, at, at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters, and the cosmic ray incidence counts. So uh, we, we've just designed a tremendously complicated data structure. We've got 10 HRV measures. We've got 12 environment variables. We've got 16 human participants, each of whom is an idiosyncratic individual. And because uh, HRV responses to stimuli often display a time delay, we have 81 different time lags to test for a time delayed response. Uh, that, that's a total of 155,000 and some individual uh, things that we're looking at. So this, this needs to be simplified before we can do anything with it. Uh, so, 
I mentioned that the, uh, the individuals are idiosyncratic and unique. Um, so we decided that we weren't even going to try to interpret their individual differences. We would just use a population average, which means that we're actually throwing away some of the most interesting data about in individual physiological responses, but it also gets rid of an entire axis of questions that we would otherwise be trying to analyze. Uh, for the, the average is a, a weighted mean that takes into account the different amounts of data contributed by each participant. The method we use for the analogy, for the analyses, is multivariate linear regression. Uh, this has the advantage of being able to compute the effect of multiple contributing variables simultaneously and sort them out from each other. And I have a detailed explanation of how that works, which I will reserve for an appendix if we have the time. Uh, hello. Oh, there we go. So just as a quick overview, from the raw data, we first remove circadian variations. And then for each HRV measure, for each participant, at each time offset, we do a multivariate regression analysis on all 12 environment variables. We calculate the weighted mean across participants to get the population averages. Then we apply a Bonferroni correction for the number of lags and, take the mo and apply that to the most statistical to the data from the lag with the highest level of statistical significance. Bonferroni correction is basically a technique you apply to compensate for the inherent bias of, I've got a bunch of tests, and I'm taking the one that looks best. How much do I need to dilute my p-value to reflect the effect of cherry picking the best result? And here's the summary of the overall results. Uh, 12 12 environment variables versus uh, 10 HRV measures. And the legend of rainbow colors running around the, the side, this violet shade at the top corresponds to a p-value of 10 to the minus 15th power or less. In fact, this one square here showing up in deep violet, sorry, I'm ignoring one side of the room, uh, actually has a p-value of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 16th power. That's after correcting for the fact that it's the best lag out of 81 lags. And of course, we've got 120 separate tests here, so we can do a separate Bonferroni correction for that, and that dilutes our uh, p-value all the way to 1.9 times 10 to the minus 14th power. How disappointing. And as you can see, there are uh, quite a few other uh, significant results. In fact, and I apologize for the fine print, uh, <clears throat> of these 120 tests, 74% of them are significant at a 0.05 level or better at basically anything that's not black. If this were a chance phenomenon, uh, only about 5% of that 120, or in other words, about six of those squares should be showing any color. Um, looking at, at things in a little more uh, detail, but still the same overview, all 10 HRV measures are reacting to the Schumann resonance that's a brief the buttons are too close to each other on this control. Um, SFI here is the mnemonic for Schumann Fundamental Integral. It's the integrated strength of the lowest Schumann resonance frequency. And every measure is reacting to it. Uh, nine out of 10 are reacting to the 10.7 centimeter solar emissions. Eight out of 10 are reacting to cosmic ray counts. Um, only seven of the 10 react to significantly to the solar wind speed, but look at this stretch of green. We've got five out of the 10 are reacting with P less than 10 to the minus fifth to the solar wind. On the other hand, not much is reacting to the polar cap north flux, 
and there are a couple of other environmental measures that don't seem to be having much impact. Um, as, as for the measures, there are several measures that are reacting to 10 out of 12 environment measure, variables, and there are other HRV measures that show very few significant reactions. Now, how significant is significant? I've been talking about statistical significance, which just means we can assert with confidence that something is happening that is not a statistical fluke. Uh, the everyday sense of significance, on the other hand, means that something is big enough to matter. So, <clears throat> just to get an idea of the range here, the most statistically significant response is the reaction of high-frequency HRV spectral power to the Schumann resonance intensity, um, multiplying the regression coefficient by the full range of variation in the Schumann resonance produces 7.8% of the full range of variation in HRV. So in, in terms of the uh, pr pragmatic effect on physiology, we're talking about between 5 and 10% of the natural range of variation. Now, this overall evaluation ignores most of the models at different time delays. As I said, we're looking at the most significant one and applying a Bonferroni correction so that we don't fool ourselves into a making a type 1 error. However, there's a great deal more information in those time sequences, and uh, with, with numbers like 10 to the minus 16th and 10 to the minus 14th flying around, uh, we, we can afford to uh, look at a few more variables without too much risk of fooling ourselves into over-interpreting a statistical fluke. So here's five of the variables. Um, we picked five partly for visibility, partly because the other five were uh, strongly correlating with them. Uh, for the strongest response, the Schumann resonance. Um, and you can see that all of these variables are reacting in a similar way there's a sort of quasi-periodic behavior here, which is not at 24-hour intervals. So it's not a circadian influence that somehow escaped our removal of, of circadian effects. We don't know what it is. It, it's, its periodicity is about 18 to 20 hours. Uh, we, we're not aware of anything particularly significant that oscillates on that time scale. Another interesting feature of that gr graph is that nothing is reacting in real time. You look at HRV at the same time as a particular burst of activity in the Schumann resonance, no reaction. The reaction is showing up most strongly 30 hours later. Then there's also this, this thing down here which is a puzzle. It looks like there's an anticipatory response about 34 hours ahead of time. Uh, here's the variable that had multiple things reacting to it very significantly, the solar wind. Um, here we don't see quasi-periodic structure. We've just got one big peak, which again is showing up in multiple variables, that is 10 hours after the stimulus. Um, now, an interesting feature about this is that the solar wind doesn't reach Earth's surface. Supposedly, it affects Earth because it changes the shape of the magnetosphere and so distorts the Earth's magnetic field. But the HRV response to the solar wind is stronger than the response to most of the geomagnetic indices. Uh, how is... Uh, uh, how, how is that happening if the solar wind should be mediating its effect through the Earth's magnetic field? Again, we, we don't know. Uh, as with the previous one, there's nothing much visible in, in real time at a time lag of zero. And there is, once again, not as strong, but a rather puzzling hint of an anticipatory reaction about 34 hours prior to the stimulus. And I just 
sorry, 30 hours on this one. I went the wrong way getting to my discussion. So, uh, conclusions. The search for HRV responses to geomagnetic and cosmic variables returns a strong yes, despite the number of individual tests made. The strongest physiological responses are delayed by 10 to 30 hours, depending on what variable we're looking at. Some of the strongest responses to cosmic variables do not seem to be mediated by the geomagnetic field. And these results provide some indications of which environmental variables and which HRV measures will be most useful to track in future studies. Uh, speaking of future studies, things that could bear more inv investigation, uh, we ignored individual variations here for the sake of simplicity. Uh, what could we learn by actually looking at them? Do individual patterns of HRV response correlate usefully with a person's physical condition or health needs? Um, will a larger study population show the same or similar effects? We've got a tremendous number of data points, but one weakness of this study is that we only have 16 volunteers, and they're all from the same culture, same geographical region. They could very easily be a biased sample compared to the general human population. Um, the anticipatory reactions are a puzzle. We still don't know how we're supposed to interpret them. And then there's the question I already mentioned that uh, the, the solar wind doesn't seem to be working through the magnetospheric effects. Uh, so how does it have its effect? I first want to suggest we talk about heart rate variability and I'm going to argue that you're really not affecting the heart, you're affecting the autonomic nervous system because I don't think you're actually capturing the heart beat like with pacemakers. So you're dealing with autonomic nervous system. So once you deal with that, you even got to talk about seat, sleep, uh, you got to talk about REM, you got to talk about, you know, diet. Now, I don't know, I was involved in a study with Ramadan with the people in, in Saudi Arabia. I don't know if that was going on when you did your study. But there's all these other factors that are really important. It's good data and exciting, but, you know, we got to talk about the nervous system, which we're talking about the brain, really, and the autonomic nervous system, not stimulating the heart. Those are all very good points, and I suspect that this has a lot to do with why the effects we're seeing only explain a small portion of the natural variability. That, uh, that natural variation comes from somewhere, and all of the factors that you listed are relevant to it. Yes, the, uh, uh, the, the, the autonomic nervous system is tremendously important to heart function and does regulate it in a healthy individual. But the, uh, the, the, the heart rate variability was the physiological measure that the, the heart math people chose to work with for a, a, a variety of reasons, uh, in, including the ones that I mentioned early on. Uh, York, I was, I think this was a terrific presentation, and uh, <clears throat> I must admit that it provides very sort of powerful uh, evidence of a sort of a relationship of individual physiological variables to the cosmic environment. Well, the obvious question to me is, mm -hmm. well, if this is what the sun can do to people, do the planets also have an effect? Because one thinks about the Mars effect, for instance, as an example, and I must admit that when the Gokulin stuff on the Mars effect came out, most of us were saying, well, how could that, how could that be? Okay, but everybody was thinking about gravitational pull and so forth. Nobody thought about these other variables. So the obvious question, again, in my mind is, do the planets have any effect? And might that influence things like the Mars effect? I assume you know what that is. Uh, yes, I'm familiar with the Gokulon Mars effect. And the thing with that is that it is a, a, a purely empirical statistical correlation that was found that has no, no underlying mechanism that anybody has been able to suggest. These, exactly. The, the, these, 
uh, environmental variables that I mentioned are all literally measurable features of the physical environment. Right. They, they are things that can be physically detected at either at Earth's surface or in the immediate vicinity with instruments, which um, I, I'm sorry, yes, the planets are out there. They have, they have gravitational effects. They have electromagnetic effects. Those are all many orders of magnitude smaller. We than, assume. Uh, what, what yeah. the things we're looking at. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. So a, a speculative comment on the anticipatory effect and mm -hmm. perhaps the 18-hour <coughs> cycle that you see. Uh, several years ago, Dick Schaup gave an absolutely mind-blowing talk in which he showed a correlation between various human events and solar wind activity just at the sun. In other words, activity solar wind as it was leaving the sun, not as it was arriving on Earth. So uh, as if we were reacting to something that was happening out there now. And uh, there hasn't been any follow-up on this. It was, it was just a, a series of correlations that he did. But I wonder whether some of these time effects that you're seeing may be because uh, the response is not due to what's hitting the Earth, but it's due to the source of perhaps the solar winds, for example. Well, that is a very interesting speculation, and I have to admit that the solar wind correlation in particular looks an awful lot like the proverbial spooky action at a distance because it doesn't look like it's being mediated by anything we know about. Uh, so. If, uh, if there's a reaction to stuff that's happening all the way out there at the surface of the sun, yes, that, that would show up as anticipatory <coughs> compared to the measurements of the solar wind reaching Earth's magnetosphere. Thank you very much, Mark.